cannabis for many reasons. Some of them are rather obvious, I think, uh, given the blockade of research that you've already heard about, etc. Um, we uh, uh, are a national uh, veteran service organization, and uh, I am a, a disabled veteran myself. I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. I uh, do not suffer from post-traumatic stress. Well, I, I, I'm not a post-traumatic stress patient, but I, I am a, a pain patient. Um, I have, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, easy to look at someone like me, uh, someone who's suffering even from post-traumatic stress, and make the mistake that I'm an able-bodied person. Uh, I had to take some pretty serious narcotics to be able to walk around like I'm doing today. Um, I just come up from Virginia, where I spent a couple of weeks uh, without access to cannabis because the law in Virginia does not cover pain. It only covers cancer and glaucoma. And uh, <coughs> suffering pretty bad, and you're getting to see me at kind of a low ebb. I apologize for that. I, I am I am an Oregon medical cannabis card holder. Thanks to your laws reciprocating coverage, I am also legal in the state of Michigan. And uh, if you were able to see me this evening, uh, after I'm able to medicate, I'm sure you'll see a different person. Um, I've got some notes here I try to get through. Uh, I uh, am 100% rated by the VA, 100% uh, service connected, total permanent. Got an artificial hip, lost my spleen, parts of my intestines, uh, cracked my skull. I've got uh, multiple fractures, with pins and plates. Um, it's, a, it's a rough, rough going. Um, and even at that, it's nothing compared to what the uh, sorry, it's nothing compared to the vets that are su suffering from post-traumatic stress. My colleague Al Byrne, command, Lieutenant Commander. Navy, Vietnam era, he's worked for 35 years uh, on this issue. He's educated me and uh, brought me up to speed. And it's a, it's a torture that goes on every minute of your life. And, and it ends in some pretty horrific death that can be avoided. These are avoidable deaths. Cannabis can help. And uh, I, I, I want to start out here by telling you a little bit of history, Michigan history. I think it's important, you know, we're, we're in Michigan. Michigan has a rich history of cannabis access. You may not know anything about it. This book right here is a Park Davis medical book. It's got, it's 1913. It comes out of Kalamazoo. Park Davis led the world in cannabis research. There's eight pages of fine print telling you everything that you're hearing here in different words. They use nervous exhaustion instead of post-traumatic stress. They use melancholia instead of depression. But it's all in here. A hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, we knew this. And the government wiped it out. Wiped it out. A hundred years of suffering. Veterans came back from World War I, and they could go up to a pharmacy in Kalamazoo and get cannabis. In World War II, they couldn't. Why? Why, I ask you. I encourage you to read this, study it, learn what, we, what we've forgotten. If you want to know Park Davis history, look at Pfizer. That's who owns Park Davis now. It's not gone away. It still exists. I, I want to uh, call your attention to an Army memo that just came out uh, this April. This uh, memo uh, talked about the uh, drugs that uh, are commonly used for, uh, for treatment of post-traumatic stress. They, uh, they talked about uh, uh, Xanax and Valium, said it increases the problems. In their words, the risks outweigh the rewards from benzodiazepines. Not recommended. Seroquel and Risperdal. This is the Army Surgeon General, I remind you. Risperdal and Seroquel, 
the uh, antipsychotics not useful. Side effects outweigh the benefits. These, these drugs, they, they do have suicide as a, as a, a, a risk of, of taking the drug, from the drug, the risk of suicide. Even if you didn't have post-traumatic post stress, I imagine that drug could put you in a position to kill yourself by itself. This is unbelievable. The only drugs that are approved for post-traumatic stress are Zoloft and Paxil. Again, in their words, minimal impact on post-traumatic stress. I, I want to take a moment to talk about disorder. You know, this is unfortunate. This is a new term, post-traumatic stress disorder. My, my colleague Al Byrne has instructed me it's inappropriate. You know, they used to call it shell shock. They called it battle fatigue. These are more appropriate. Why? Because it's not a disorder. It's not a disorder. If you take 100 people and you put them in a battle zone where they get blown up, a certain percentage of them are going to have these neurological effects. We're, we're starting to learn about plaque on the brain, about ECT. Look these things up. These, this is what's happening. It's a, it's a physiological response to a, to a non necessarily, not, not even necessarily physical trauma. But it's a physiological response. This isn't a personal weakness. It's not a personal failing. And it does, it does respond to cannabis. You know, th this uh, idea that's been floated about the uh, veterans that are using cannabis in Michigan, but are on, under chronic pain. I want to address this as a national advocate. This is a problem for me. It, you have two problems there. One is you have an inflated role of pain management patients, which then incites police to work against your program because they see that as fraud. And it is fraud. It is. Because the real indication that would be primary is not pain. So it is fraud. And I encourage you to help end that fraud by allowing post-traumatic stress to be the ailment of choice for those that are actually, the, 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 that's their key indication. And then when we get statistics back, we'll be able to see, like we have in New Mexico, the differentiation between those whose primary ailment is pain versus those whose primary ailment is post-traumatic stress. I can't sort that out from Virginia. I, I, I need your help. VA policy. You may know that the Veterans Affairs Department has issued a, a, a policy allowing veterans to use medical marijuana in the states. We're responsible for that policy. We created it. I helped write it. If you'd like to know more about it, I, I encourage you to ask. We also petitioned the White House successfully through their We the People site and got a response back from the drug czar. So I, I encourage you to, to look at that as well. You know, um, right now, we have uh, Connecticut, Delaware, and New Mexico that specifically have post-traumatic stress in their medical marijuana state law. California and Massachusetts, of course, are doing it the way you should do it, which is allowing doctors to recommend cannabis the way they prescribe the other 10,000 drugs that they work with according to the standards of medical care. So, of course, post-traumatic stress can be an option for patients in California and Massachusetts. And now, thanks to the legalization initiatives, adults in Washington, Colorado can also use cannabis for post-traumatic stress. I, uh, that's all my notes. I, I, I really want to emphasize that you know, we, we look at these, all these drugs. I encourage you to just pick one of those, Paxil. Look it up and look under how it works. Look at the mechanism of action, unknown. Look at any of those drugs. Look at the mechanism of action, unknown. You look at cannabis, we know the mechanism of action. Why? Because the United States government has spent hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not on new drug applications, not on getting the medicine in people's hands, but on trying to prove its danger. When they failed to prove its danger, they patented its benefits. 
but they still don't allow us to research it. They don't allow us to have access to it. But I encourage you, I encourage you to look at the fact that we do understand now the mechanism of action of this incredible substance. We have this endogenous cannabinoid receptor system. It's throughout your entire body. You have it, you have it, you have it. We all have it. We can't live without it. It's just like your adrenaline system. I'm not a doctor. I can't give you the terms. Talk to our advisor, Dr. Melmead. Professor Melmead, as you've heard from a couple of people, is a, a, a wizard with this information. And, and I encourage you to take advantage of him. But we do know the mechanism of action. And this, it, it's complicated, but it's simple. It works. And, and it's something that explains why this works for so many different things. It's a neurological component. It's a, it's, it's a medicine that has many, many different applications, but they all make sense when you look at it through the lens of the endogenous cannabinoid receptor system. So I, I thank you for your time. I, I recognize that veterans aren't the only ones that suffer from this. I encourage you to consider all the, the patients that need this.